Good day to you. Keith Kaiser here once again with studies in the Gospel according to Matthew. Today we're in Matthew chapter 1, working our way through our Lord's genealogy. And we come today to uh, verse number 7, uh, verse 7 of Matthew 1, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 7. It says, Solomon begot Rehoboam, and Rehoboam begot Abijah, and Abijah begot Asa, Asa begot Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat begot Joram, and Joram begot Uzziah, Uzziah begot Jotham, Jotham begot Ahaz, and Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh, Manasseh begot Ammon, Ammon begot Josiah, and Josiah begot Jeconiah, and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And so we see again a lot of history summarized in these names. And any reader of the Bible who goes back to the books of First Kings and First Chronicles especially gets the story of many of these figures. In fact, if we go all the way to the deportation to Babylon, we include Second Kings and Second Chronicles. So there are many stories behind these different people, things that happened during their reigns. And yet the genealogy here is selective, just as it's important for the Holy Spirit to put in the four Gentile women that we've seen so far, Tamar, that Judah committed incest with, and yet God overcame that sin and failure and continued the line. And then, of course, Rahab, who, as we saw, was part of a cursed city of Jericho in a terrible profession. And so God saves people from the bottom of the barrel, as it were, people that we might expect they're too far gone or they come from a neighborhood that's too far. Nobody would ever be interested in God's grace. And yet Rahab was hungry for God's grace, cried out to the Lord, and the Lord didn't disappoint her. He saved her. Ruth, the Moabitess, again, another cursed people, and yet brought in and become the ancestress both of King David and by extension of Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And then Bathsheba, who was the wife of Uriah, but taken away by adultery and ultimately murder to try to cover that act up. And David took her as wife, and it's through her that Solomon was produced. Of course, when we look at Solomon's life, he was no great shakes, uh, morally speaking, in the second half of his reign. The first half was pretty good, but unfortunately he did many things that God's word told him not to do. He multiplied wives, he multiplied horses, he established international treaties and trade and so forth. And so there was a great deal of power and prosperity, but his heart was turned toward idols by the women whom he had married. And during his son's reign, Rehoboam, of course, outright civil war broke out. The nation was divided into the 10 northern tribes called in the Old Testament Israel, or sometimes Ephraim, after the largest clan in that family. And um, that nation was to the north and then to the south. There was Judah that was also given Benjamin. And of course, they had the Levites because they had Jerusalem in the temple. And they had a smattering of people from other tribes, no doubt, that identified with them. But we had the northern kingdom of Israel versus the southern kingdom of Judah. And that divided monarchy continued until 721 BC when the Assyrians took the 10 northern tribes off into captivity. And the southern tribes continued until 586 BC when they were carried by Babylon away into captivity. Of course, they were restored. The northern tribes were never restored. That doesn't mean, again, that there weren't people from those tribes that continued as a remnant in the nation. But the bulk of those tribes uh, never came back from captivity. And yet we read in Revelation, eventually the whole nation is going to be gathered from the four corners of the earth, as it were. Now, when we look further, we can see some of these kings were bad, some of them were good, some of them were a mixed bag. Uh, with Israel's kings, it's a lot easier to keep track of, starting with Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, all the way to Hosea. They were bad kings. Uh, each and every one of them followed an apostate religion of the golden calves at Dan and Bethel. But in Judah, many of the kings were God-fearing and were believers. You can think about, for instance, this Asa, who was a godly king, who did a lot of good things. He strengthened the nation, strengthened its defenses. He stood up for 
the right worship of the Lord. And yet, unfortunately, when you read about his history, it says, but when he was old, he was diseased in his feet. And instead of seeking to the Lord, he sought to the physicians. Now, there's nothing wrong, of course, with medical science. God has given us brains and he has allowed human beings to discover things and to invent medical technology that helps us and makes our lives better. And God, after all, providentially uses man's means every day in our lives. So he uses our jobs, whether or not our, our bosses believe in God or not, whether or not they know the Lord Jesus Christ or not, we get a paycheck. And that's our Father in heaven meeting our needs. Or uh, many people get treatment from doctors and you don't say, well, I want to check and see, is this doctor born again? Because otherwise the medicine won't be efficacious. The treatment won't be effective. And of course, that's not so. We go to all kinds of doctors, every creed and stripe, and whether they're religious or irreligious or nominally Christian or actually born again Christian, has nothing to do with what sort of a doctor they are or what sort of nurses we encounter or what sort of effect a medicine's going to have. God's not against medicine. The problem is Asa was being disciplined for turning away from the Lord and not listening to his word. And uh, the Bible brings that out very clearly when you go back and read the accounts. And instead of repenting, he tried to find an end around. He tried to find some other expedient to remove the consequences of his sin without repenting and getting right with God. And even though he was a believer, he needed to repent. And, you know, we have to understand that. Repentance is something we learn about first in the gospel. We need to see ourselves as the sinners for whom Christ died. And we repudiate that. We say, I don't want to be a sinner anymore. I don't want to live for myself and be independent of God. I want to submit to God and receive the righteousness, which is by faith in the Lord Jesus, the one who loved us and gave himself for us, the one who died for our sins, according to the scriptures, on the cross and was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And we say, I'm trusting in you. It's by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that we are justified and receive the grace of God, the free gift of salvation. But then as believers, we sometimes need to repent too, because we still uh, have wrong ideas and we still can fall into sin if we're not careful. And unfortunately, we still all do that one time or another. And what's to be done? Well, as believers, we do the same thing. We repent. We say, I stand with God against myself and my sin. I can't defend it. I can't make excuses. I repudiate it. I confess it to the one who says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So rather than submitting to the chastening, to the chastisement, or we'd call it today discipline, Asa continued on in his sin and refused to hearken unto God. And so God sent him consequences <clears throat> to try and move him to repentance, but he didn't do it. Now, his son Jehoshaphat was a much more consistent godly king, but even there you can find things to criticize. This is one of the hallmarks of the historicity of the Holy Scriptures. In other words, that the Bible is historically accurate, that it's faithful, a faithful record of things that actually happened. These aren't myths or fables. And Jehoshaphat showed an all-too-human proclivity to be influenced by his friends. We warn young people about peer pressure, but if we're honest, we who are middle-aged or older, uh, we're as susceptible to peer pressure as anybody. Uh, in other words, evil, uh, evil uh, associations corrupt good manners, as the scriptures say in 1 Corinthians. And if we're hanging out with people in an unequal yoke, where they're driving the bus, so to speak, they're determining our moral behavior and how we think and act. Uh, we need to sever those kinds of relationships. We want to be friendly toward people that don't know the Lord. We want to win them to Christ and win the opportunity for preaching the gospel to them through love. But at the same time, we don't want to adopt their mores and values uh, that come from people that don't know the Lord and don't have, therefore, the indwelling Holy Spirit who is sanctifying us and teaching us and empowering us to live like the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this was a problem for Jehoshaphat, who got linked up with Ahab in 1 Kings 22, and later got linked up with one of his sons in an ill-fated attempt to form a fleet at uh, the southern part of, of Israel, at Elat. 
And uh, God had to chasten him for those things. But in distinction from his father, Jehoshaphat was always one who turned back to the Lord in repentance. Who His bent was toward the Lord, which was a good thing. Now, interestingly, when we come to after um, Jehoshaphat there in verse 8, we come to Joram and Joram begot Uzziah and Uzziah begot Jotham and so forth. Between Joram and Uzziah, we have three generations, three kings and approximately 60 years of history omitted. And we're told this is a very curated list even when you compare it with the old testament genealogies you can find the names that are missing and that's to bring about a symmetry in the genealogy where there are 14 generations from uh, from abraham to david and then from david to the captivity and then from the captivity to the lord jesus christ we read this summary in verse 17 so all the generations from abraham to david are 14 generations from david until the captivity in Babylon, 14 generations, and from the captivity in Babylon unto Christ, 14 generations. Some people have suggested that it might be a case of gematria, which is a Hebrew uh, way of writing, a style where they would give numerical values to letters. And if you take the three consonants in David's name, Hebrew is a language that's written consonantally. They just write the consonants and they don't put the vowels in. You know what the vowels are by the context. So if we were transliterating into English, it would look like DVD on the page. And if you add up the numerical value of the three letters of David's name, it comes to 14. So some have argued that this is a way of emphasizing, underscoring for us that the Lord Jesus is the son of David, that he's the Messiah, that he's really this uh, new David, if you will, that's coming. Well, Perhaps there's something in that. But even more, I think we're seeing that God has purposes in history. And the story he's telling here is not just a story of how it goes individually from one person to another. Of course, God is working in each of these individual lives. But God had a bigger picture in mind, a bigger plan that he was doing. And each of these epochs, if you will, started out with tremendous hope and tremendous opportunity uh, for progress and for blessing. And each one of them, unfortunately, uh, ended in failure. And so we can look at Abraham, you know, with this great promise that is being made to Abraham. But by the end, before we get to David, we come to a real spiritual low point in Israel's history when right before David, we get Saul. And uh, the times of the judges when, in which he lived, and he was at the end of those times, in the beginning of the monarchy. And he was really an ungodly king, not in the line of the Lord Jesus, of course. Uh, the Lord picked David, a neighbor of his, as he said, who would be better than him, that he would fulfill all his purposes. He called David a man after his own heart. But David's reign starts with so much promise as well, doesn't it? And what does it end with? In verse 11, and we read that it ends with them being carried away to Babylon. And when you read the last chapter of Second Chronicles or the opening chapter of Ezra, a virtually identical language, it tells us that though the Lord had sent so many, in Second Chronicles at least, it says, though the Lord had sent so many prophets to them rising up early over the centuries, calling Israel to repentance, calling his people to turn back to him, they didn't do it until he had to take them away from the land into that captivity. And yet, Second Chronicles ends with a glimmer of hope of the proclamation of Cyrus, and that's how Ezra begins. So, uh, again, there's the disappointment that what started with David with so much promise ends in failure. And then we go from that failure in Babylon, uh, we have that remnant coming back, where we read about Zerubbabel. And you remember how under Zerubbabel, the civil leader, and, and uh, also Joshua, the son of Josedek, the spiritual leader, there was a remnant of almost 50,000 Jews that came back to the land. So great hope there, as suddenly they're in the land again. There's a remnant there. And yet, uh, when we get down through the centuries and we come now to the times of the Lord Jesus Christ, in our account, uh, the nation was far away from God. And it's in that time, in what Galatians 4.4 4 would call 
the fullness of times, that's when the Lord Jesus was born. So these genealogies aren't haphazardly put together. There's a literary artistry. There's a certain order. There's a, a theology, if you will, behind them. We're seeing the purposes of God unfold. And by the way, I'm indebted to David Gooding's thoughts in his book, Riches of Divine Wisdom, for that last thought about each of these three epochs. And so you can look further to Brother Gooding's book, The Riches of Divine Wisdom, to unpack that in greater detail. But we'll see that as the Lord Jesus comes into the world, he comes in at a very dark time spiritually, and yet a time when everything has reached a ripeness for new revelation, for the new message that the king has actually been born into the world. The king of Israel, but not just the king of Israel, the king of the nations, the one who one day we're going to know as king of kings and lord of lords. Well, we say, even so, come Lord Jesus. And if you're not right with him, we say, repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so that you might be saved. Thank you for listening.